All right. Are we on? Is the mic working and all? Has a little sound meter up there moving? All right. So that's good. <clears throat> Question is, can you actually hear me though? I think I've got the right microphone turned up. So we'll see here shortly. Because I think I got the right microphone on it this time. Turned up the right way this time, so we'll see what happens. <clears throat> we good? Fantastic. All right, it's a little bit past seven, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, as you may notice, a different backdrop. Um, I figure Delilah, Delilah's got her painting utensils on the table, and instead of her taking them on and off every week, I figured I'd try this, and we might change some things up as we go through. Uh, either way, uh, we're not going to be recording from here next Wednesday night, um, so I figured change the pace a little bit and see what happens, and if we like this, we might keep it, and if not, we can always go back to kitchen table. Um, next week, uh, however, we will be in Chicago at the conference. Uh, we will still meet um, at 7 o'clock our time. Uh, we'll still do the Bible study Wednesday night live from Chicago if the Wi-Fi works. Yeah, if it doesn't, we'll let you, we'll let you all know. So, um, but as of right now, we're planning on going live next Wednesday uh, from the conference and we'll still have time to get over to the uh, the message that evening too so all right <clears throat> um, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 14 and we'll get started I think this is lesson eight if I'm not mistaken of the evangelism training we're on lesson six on the actual paper uh, but we've done this is our eighth video uh, and the fact that we're on lesson six tonight means we're getting close to the end um, there's only eight lessons that we have, and uh, we'll go through this as, uh, as quickly, but as thoroughly as we possibly can. So a couple things just to make sure that we're on the right track. Go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 14. We're going to read verses 21, 22, and 23, and then we'll get going. So Acts chapter 14, verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through, and that we must through much tribulation enter in to the kingdom of God. And when they had hurt, and when they had ordained them elders in every church, and had prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. May we take the information that we received tonight, study it out for ourselves, that it may become our own information that we can use with our personalities. Um, the way that we deal with things, the way that we speak with people, that we can take this information and present a clear and concise and precise gospel to a lost and dying world that we're able to take them through your scriptures and show them that they're lost, that they need a Savior, and then take them to the other side and give them the opportunity to make that decision of place in their own personal faith in the cross work of Jesus Christ, that they might have eternal life. But not just leave them there, but give them the tools that would allow them to grow up in grace afterwards that we might be able to help them along with their life, that they might be able to produce the life that you have them to produce to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Now, as we've gone through this, we've gone through the first three phases. Phase one, of course, is coming to the point where we find out where the person is spiritually. We discern, are they saved or are they lost, based upon simple questions being able to take them to the point to show them that they are, in fact, just like everybody else, a sinner in need of a Savior. And then we show them that God has made the provision and given them the ability to have perfect righteousness because the only way that you can get into heaven 
is through perfect righteousness. And we found out through Romans chapter 3, verses 23, 24, and 25, that God has told us that we've all missed the mark, but He's made it possible through the blood of Jesus Christ that we might have justification unto eternal life. The second part, obviously, is the presentation of the gospel. And the third part, which was what we talked about the last time, is leading that person to the point of a decision that they make a decision of their own to place their faith, their simple faith, in, in the cross work of Christ. The next part that we're going to talk about tonight is going to be the follow-up. You know, and, and I've, watched, I've watched these guys on TV, uh, Joel Osteen and all these other guys, at the end of their, their messages, they'll say, if you want to have, if you want to be saved, then say this simple prayer after me. And then they'll say this little prayer and it has nothing to do with the gospel. They've never presented the gospel. They've never presented the fact that they're lost and going to hell. They've never presented the fact that they are a sinner. And then they're going to say, if you believe and you pray this prayer, then we believe that you're saved. And then the last part they'll say is, find yourself a good Bible-believing church and start attending and doing all that. And that's just... The whole thing's a mess. They don't give them the gospel. Don't tell them that they're a sinner. Don't give them the gospel. Don't give them the good news. Don't tell them that they have justification unto your eternal life. And then they say, go find a Bible church on your own. <clears throat> the whole thing's a mess. One of the most important issues that we have here is, is as we take a look in, in Acts chapter 14, what Paul does is, after they go and they preach the gospel to that city, they taught many. They returned again to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, and they confirmed the souls of the disciples and exhorted them to continue in the faith. They go back and they make sure that they're actually following the truth of the gospel and following in that studying of the, uh, of the Bible to be able to find out who they are in Christ. To be able to know who you are in Christ is a great motivating factor for you to know what grace does in your life and that it's not you that's doing stuff but it's God doing stuff through you through his son living and working in you and this part the the follow-up is a very crucial part of the evangelism process if you want to think of it as a process it's not just being not just being follow-up but being effective in the follow-up now, one of the things that we know, you know, you can go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and Paul talks about them being babes in Christ. And you go over to 1 Peter chapter 2 and it's basically the same issue. Think about how, how vulnerable you are. You know, it's one of those things when you, when you go and you witness to a person and they've come to a point where they say, I'm going to believe the gospel. I'm going to believe that Jesus Christ paid my penalty that he was buried and then he rose again the third day to prove that that penalty was paid. You get them to that point. I would suggest you not to say, all right, so I'm going to add you to this, this, and this Facebook group so you can learn about right division. Because <laughs> that stuff's a mess. Effective follow-up. You personally taking the time to follow up with that person or get them to somebody, one particular person that you know and you trust that you can get them to and to be able to help them come into the knowledge of the truth of who they are in Christ. Don't send them out there. That's, that's no different. The only difference between that and what these guys do on TV is you've actually gotten them to, to trust the right gospel. But that's just the same as, well, go find this stuff and see if you can figure out some truths. <clears throat> right? The big thing is, is if you've got a local assembly. That's, that's the issue. Get them into the local assembly. Allow them to come into the knowledge of the truth that way. That's, that's where we're going to be able to see this. Um, <clears throat> in fact, go over real quick. Get First Thessalonians chapter 2 and we will see we'll see how Paul kind of deals 
deals with this and it's it's an immediate thing you want to make sure that you get the person in there as soon as possible first Thessalonians chapter 2 first Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8 he says so being affectionately desirous of you we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. Given a, given a little bit of, of yourself to be able to help this person along, that's going to go a long way. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe, as ye now, or as ye know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye should that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Being able to take a person and show them the life and how Paul demonstrates right here, how he takes those people and say, I want to bring you along, right? And that's the whole part of being able to say that we've not just given you the gospel only, but we've also given you our own souls because you're dear to us. Being able to let that person know that you're not just some pick on my, you know, I go down to Speedway and they've got the little candy thing right there by the, by the cash register. And if you pick up a couple of them, you see that person reach over for a paper and they put a little mark on the paper because they get something because they sold a couple of those cheap candy bars right there at the thing. We don't want people to think that they're, they're just a little tick mark to us. Because they're not. They're, they're a soul and, and that's what they're important to us. Or they should be. And it's not just some flippant thing. Well, alright, so we've got you. So you go get in the church. You figure out what you're supposed to do in the church. And we're going to go on to the next person. And then... That's, that's, not the, that's not the point. Um, so there's a few things that we're going to go through, a list of stuff real quick. <clears throat> First, immediately after phase three, immediately after we get to the point where that person makes the decision to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we need to do is remember. Um, there's, there's a few things, one of which we... I posted, I posted some verses from Lamentations this morning. And it's one of those things, you know, people as, as grace people, most people think, well, you're not allowed to teach anything or read anything. You don't believe in anything else other than Paul's epistles. And then you do something like that, and then all of a sudden some ideas change. <clears throat> now, the, the next thing is, is they also go into they and say, well, you don't believe in prayer. And I've had a bunch of people tell me that. Another one that I've heard is um, with repentance. People don't think that we believe in repentance. Well, just because we don't, we know what the definition of repentance actually is, and it's different than how you've used it, doesn't mean that we don't believe in repentance. We do believe in repentance. In fact, go back over to Acts chapter 17, and uh, we'll take a look at a couple things. And then uh, get Acts chapter 20 as well. So Acts chapter 17 in one hand and Acts chapter 20 in the other. Repentance, again, the idea of repent, and we, we looked at those and talked about those the last time. Repent is just changing your mind. That's all repentance is. Okay, It's not feeling sorry for your sins or, or, or um, you know, the old thing. Old Billy, Billy Graham. Well, you got to repent of your sins. That, that means you have to be sorry. And well, the question is, is how sorry? He says, real sorry. Well, how much is real sorry? Repentance, repent, just has to do with changing your mind. We have to constantly be changing our mind. Uh, and that, that's one of the things. Notice, notice here in, in in Acts chapter 17. Let's start in verse uh, 29. Start off, Acts chapter 17, we're starting off in verse 29. Notice he says, For as much then as we are 
the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now when you start saying repent, most people think Acts chapter 2 and they, they go back there and said, you have to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins and that's not the gospel. We've already clearly talked about that that's not the gospel. Understanding that it's that God's commanded all men everywhere to repent. Okay? All men everywhere, all the time. Go over to Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> Acts chapter 20, verse 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing who God was, changing your mind to who God was in your thought process. You know, And as you go through there, the Jews and the Gentiles and, 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 and all those folks back there, they had to change their mind of who they thought God was. And that's repentance is, is an issue that we don't take lightly. We do believe in repentance because we know and understand that repentance just has to do with changing your mind. So when we talk about this, we have to make sure that it's properly defined when we talk to people about this so that they know exactly what it is. As saved individuals, do we still repent? The answer is yes. We are constantly to be changing our minds about who we are in Christ, who we are as members of the church, the body of Christ. That's the whole point with Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. How do we renew our mind? Or how do we transform ourselves? We renew our mind. How do we renew our mind? We change our mind. We come to a point where we say, this is what I used to do. I don't want to do that anymore. And I want to change how I think about this situation. And we do it. And we've just repented. But we want to make sure that we keep the definition proper. The next thing with effective follow-up is questioning. Allowing us to test the decision that the people have just made. So here's some follow-up questions that we can ask the person after phase three, after they've come to the point. Now, <clears throat> one of the first things we want to do is do you really mean the decision that you've just made? And if they say yes, then say, okay, let me ask you a couple of questions here real quick. If you were to die right now, where would you spend eternity? And you all can do this in and of yourself right now. If you were to die right now, where would you spend eternity? How do you know that you would spend eternity in heaven? Okay, you got to think, this is, on the, this is on the back side of phase three. The, the person's already made this decision. And we can find out whether or not they actually do believe the right thing or not. All right? <clears throat> what, did, what did God say that he would give you when you trusted Christ? The answer to that is what? Eternal life. All right? How long does eternal life last? And the answer Etern it's, it's eternal, forever. Do you think that you could ever get out of the family of God? Well, if, if you've got eternal life and it lasts forever, then you can't get out of the family. So no, I don't think I can get out of the family. Well, what happens when you sin? Well, you recognize the fact that this isn't who I am as a saint of the Most High God. Jesus Christ has already paid for that, for that sin. God's already forgiven me because I'm in Christ. And I don't have to worry about that sin. And know what I need to do now is start changing my thought process and not do that anymore. Those are the answers you're looking for. And when, when they give you the proper answers, then we know that they've made the right decision. So now we want to make sure that we nail down their understanding of the gospel. First of all, assurance. Eternal life as a free gift 
Complete and total forgiveness. Being able to go through Colossians 2.13. Go through Romans chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Welcome them into the family of God. One of the first things a person should do, most people say, well, what do I do now that I'm saved? And they say, go get a Bible and start reading the book of John. That's the worst thing you can possibly do. When you get a person and they've made that decision to get saved, what I would tell them to do, I want you to go read the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 8 verses 31 through 39. Go read those for three, four weeks. Get, get grounded in who you are. Just go and rest in, in who you are in Christ. Go find out what God's done for you. Justified you freely. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. We have peace with God. Just, just tell them to go read those two things and then they'll, they'll be fine. <clears throat> Getting them to understand their completeness and their identif identification in Christ and understanding who they are now in Christ, their new identity. Take them over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Show them that they're part of a new man. They're part of a new creature. They're part of something new. They're no longer in Adam, but now they're in Christ. And there's a whole new thing that we have because we're in Christ. There's, there's a completeness that we have. Being able to go through and show them the mechanics of the one baptism of Romans chapter 6. Being able to show them that there is no need for water baptism. We show them that there's one baptism, Ephesians chapter 4. We go and show them what that one baptism is. And that's where Christ places you, or where the Spirit places you into into Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And then being able to show them that it has absolutely nothing to do with water, Romans chapter 6. Go get 1 Corinthians, or yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. We find out that, that, God, that Christ didn't send Paul to baptize, but to preach the gospel. We've already looked at that verse. We've talked about that before. That doesn't mean that Paul was just an evangelist and he was just supposed to go evangelize the people and get them saved and then the 12 were going to come behind. And No, that's not what it was. If Paul's gospel was the same as Peter's gospel, Peter's gospel, they were to what? Part of that gospel was they were supposed to baptize. Paul's gospel, he's not supposed to baptize. Well, if they're preaching the same gospel, either Peter's wrong or Paul's wrong. It's that simple. Well, that tells us automatically, according to some other verses, that we know that there's two gospels in any way. In fact, there's more than that, but I don't have time for that in this video. Being able to understand their completeness in Christ. Being able to take them to Colossians chapter 2 verse 10. Being able to take them over to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 and find out that they have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And then that in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1 it goes through and shows you and lists you those spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Being able to take them to Galatians chapter 2 and Romans chapter 6 and show them that His death is your death. His crucifixion was your crucifixion. His burial was your burial. His resurrection is now your resurrection. The complete and total identification that we have in Christ. Because we're in Christ, being able to show them that stuff. Make sure that they, make sure that they have a King James Bible. Make sure that they have a Bible that has absolutely no mistakes. And then showing them the need of the to to continue in that edification process. Being able to go through Colossians chapter 1 verses 9 through 11 and chapter 2 verses 6 and 7. Being able to show them that it's not just God's will that you get saved, but to come into the knowledge of the truth. Being able to take them to those verses and show those verses. In fact, one of the things I would say is <clears throat> I would give them a King James Bible. I mean, you can go down to Dollar Tree or Dollar Store or something like that and get one for a buck, maybe five. Get them, a, get them a little King James Bible. Go through and ask them permission if you could go through and mark some of these verses for them. In fact, I would almost say go buy them a Bible, a King James Bible, make sure it's the right one. Go through and mark some of these verses and be able to show them. I'm, I'm you know, going through this stuff today, thinking about going through, through this stuff tonight. I've almost thought I might just go buy a bunch of Bibles at the Dollar Tree. They're a dollar a piece. 
just go through and just mark all the verses that we're talking about here and be able to show them and take them to it. You know, on the front front inside of the of the of the Bible, go ahead and say, here's who you are in Christ, here's your identification, you're completing him, and then go to this verse and you'll be able to find it. And it's yours. This is your Bible that you can have. Um being able to share a Bible lesson with them. You know, just something as simple as <clears throat> well, there's really nothing too simple, but you know, <clears throat> being able to take them through all right, now that now that you're saved, let's talk about Second Timothy two fifteen. Now we've got this Bible, now we need to start studying it. Arrange for a personal contact with the person. If you can do it in person, that would be best. If you can't, phone call would be the second option. I mean, you've already got this person's name and phone number. Encourage them to attend church with you the next time. Now, I know it's one of those things it's hard to get people to come into your house. We've been there before. And... <clears throat> That might be the only church that you have. Being able to have a person come in and sit with you and say, okay, hey, let's, let's watch this service together and then we can talk about it later on. And be, be willing to say, I don't know, but let's find out together. I mean, yeah. you're, you're going to come across more genuine than just standing there and just making stuff up. Um. Make sure that you go with them. Leave them your name and phone number and let them know if you ever need to ask a question, get a hold of me, you can. And then finally, close in prayer. Ask them permission before, they, before, you, before you leave. Ask them if, uh, if you can pray with them. Because that's one of the first things that goes with a person once they get saved in the dispensation of grace is their prayer life because... All the junk we used to pray for, we don't have to pray for anymore. I mean, I don't have to pray for forgiveness. <laughs> I don't have to pray for peace with God. You know, I've already got it. So I stopped praying that stuff, and I'm not sure how to pray. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 8, we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We ought to know, but we don't know how to pray because all the, all the praying that we've ever done before was always based on false doctrine. A lot... The, the biggest thing <clears throat> that you have in prayer life now, and this is an easy way to start off with him, is it's the thankfulness. Being thankful that you're forgiven of all sins. Being thankful that his death is your death. Having complete and total, having, having the completeness that we have in Christ, being thankful for that. Being thankful that he's not going to beat us down every time we do something wrong. Being thankful that, that we're not going to have a car stall out on us just because we weren't nice to the person at Kroger. You know, that should be the issue once we start praying is just the, let that be the center of our prayer life is that thankfulness. Um, once you're finished talking to the person and you've prayed, don't, don't, don't stay around too long. Um... Even if it's a wonderful time, you know, you just, you know, excuse yourself and you can go home. Or, you know, if they're, if they're at your house, it'd be a little bit harder to go home, obviously, because you're already there. But, um, <clears throat> but make sure that you leave on a positive note um, and you're not going to sour up the issue. But being able to make up that follow-up call, talk to them. Um, the best way to do it would be to get back with them within the first 24 hours. The longer you wait, the more awkward you'll probably feel, and it's just going to make things a little bit harder. Uh, but you don't want to seem pushy at the same time, all right? Um, if your follow-up is the next time that you meet at church, attempt to make sure that you follow up with them <clears throat> um, on the following Sunday. Pray for the person 
that you've led to Christ by name every day. That one's that one's the one that's always that people kind of always forget about. God knows who you're talking about, but but being able to pray for that person by name that's going to make it more of a personal personal thing for you. Being supportive after the fact. Don't just and as I said, don't just leave them there on their own accord. They're more susceptible to false doctrine the moment that they get saved because Satan's lost his Satan's lost his soul, and he's going to try and make sure that he gets them in some junk church. And they're more susceptible to that because they don't know what's wrong and what's right yet. They don't know false doctrine yet because they've not been able to discern good and bad. They don't know what's good and what's bad. Uh, being able to follow up with them and making sure that you're consistent with that follow up. Making sure that you that they know that you're authentic. Being able to set up a particular time or date or meet go to go to Starbucks, get a coffee with them, pay for it. You know, little things. The moment that you get a person saved, they're gonna let you teach them the Bible. So don't let them go off to some false teachings. Encourage them to keep on going. Don't don't give them false hope that well now that you're saved everything's going to be fine. Let them understand it's going to be it's going to be tough, and it's going to be tougher. Yeah, yeah. Especially because they don't know yet who they are completely in Christ and they don't know all the wonderful things yet that goes along with that. I mean, I'm still learning things today that's just mind-blowing. Um, but <clears throat> giving them the opportunity to get involved in their personal edification process. Um, next part. Getting them into the church. Go by and pick them up. <laughs> and bring them, bring them to your house if you're doing a house service. Or take them to the church if you have a church. Go pick them up. Take them there. Sit with them. You know, they're going to feel awkward by themselves if they don't know anybody else. Go and sit with them. Introduce them to the pastor. Um, if you have Sunday school teachers, introduce them to them. Introduce them to the ushers. Introduce them to anybody you possibly can. Let them know that everybody's there to help them become edified. Now, of course, a lot of people in churches, they do have their own personal agendas. I understand that. But be sure to allow them to know that they, they have an opportunity to grow where they are. Um, Making sure that they actually get to the right people. Arrange for the pastor to be able to visit with them. Um, maybe through a phone call. If you can't, if you can't do it personally in person, through a phone call, being able to have a conversation with people. Um, I had a phone conversation. Was it Monday night? Last night? Last night. A guy called me up and he was talking about. <clears throat> was it Monday night? Um, he was talking about the the church where he is, and he's preaching Pauline dispensationalism truth, and and uh, I don't think the people know it fully yet. And just being able to have a conversation with the guy and encourage him in what he's doing, and let him know there are certain things that you can do to be able to help those people out. Um, he's got a, from what he said, he's got a tremendous prison ministry where. I mean, you know, you, you get to the idea, especially in that situation, people who are in prison, what's the one thing they want? Freedom. Liberty. You've got the book that will give it to them. Those people are more susceptible. The people that are in prison are more susceptible to understanding and getting a hold of this doctrine and allowing it to live in them and through them and to know that I don't, I don't care if I'm behind these bars, but I have liberty and freedom in Christ 
and I don't have to worry about God beating me down and I don't you know sometimes when you get to situations like that knowing knowing that knowing where you've come from that's a tremendous blessing to know if I'm stuck here in prison I can have freedom through this book and through this Bible you know people out here in in in, in society who are free they don't truly know and understand the 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 prison mentality even though they they might be prisoners physically or emotionally or, or spiritually speaking in their churches and they may not know it but being able to take them and show them that they can have that freedom um, making sure that we allow that person to know go in fact go over there real quick Romans chapter 16 <clears throat> this is this is obviously you know this is one of our favorite verses we we talk about it all the time letting them know about the Pauline or Pauline edification process Romans chapter 16 Paul starts off the book of Romans and he says he wants to impart unto the folks at Rome a spiritual gift to the end that they may be established and he gets down to end of Romans chapter 6 and 16 and he's given them and by that being written down to us here's the pattern of edification now to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel well we've already got that taken care of because the person's placed their faith in the gospel the second part and the preaching of Jesus Christ now not according to Matthew Mark Luke and John or the first part of Acts or by that fact not even the preaching of Jesus Christ according to Genesis through I don't know why I lost it all of a sudden. <laughs> I don't know why I lost it. <clears throat> Malachi? I don't know. I don't know why I just lost it all of a sudden. The last book of the Old Testament. I don't know why I just lost it. Yeah, I know. I, was, I don't know why I just lost it. I was like, what is it? It's Malachi, right? Yeah, it is. I don't know why I lost it. So Genesis through Malachi, you're not going to give them... The preaching of Jesus Christ from Genesis to Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first part of Acts. It's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. The only place that you see the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery is the books of Romans through Philemon. According to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scripture of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known unto, unto all nations for the obedience of faith. When we take a look at this, being able to take them and show them the Pauline pattern of edification, that edification process, get established in the gospel, get established in the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and get established in the scriptures of the prophets. Now, there's two different ways that you can take this. All right? You can either say, okay, Paul's gospel, the books of Romans through Philemon, and be able to figure that out. Then you can, pre then you can talk about, well, I can, I can understand what Jesus Christ talked about based upon what I know about the mystery and what he talked about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the first part of Acts isn't to me, but I can understand that. And then you can talk about the scriptures of the prophets, Genesis through Malachi, and you can look at it that way. Or... The best way to take a look at this would be Paul's Gospel. All right, we find that where the Book of Romans. We find that in First First Corinthians chapter fifteen. We find out it's his Gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Where do we find that at? Well, that just so happens to be in what the Book of Ephesians. He starts talking about that. He talks about that mystery in Romans, and then the. The scriptures of the prophets. Well, when Paul prophesies and he talks about, because really that's what it is, when you start talking about the things that are to take place for us in the future, future to us is what? Well, we've got the, the catching the way of the church, the body of Christ, that ascension with Christ to go meet him in the air, to go to that judgment seat of Christ, and then be able to go and, and be a part of that, 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 those heavenly places, being able to go through that stuff and know 
that we find that out throughout Paul's epistles. But more, more specifically, some of the stuff that he prophesies that stuff in is you've got 1st, 2nd Thessalonians. You can either take that and apply it to Paul's 13 Gospels or you can take it and apply it to the whole Bible. Both of them work. But what Paul's talking about here is, and what we're dealing with is make sure that they get founded in Paul's epistles and understand who they are. Don't let them get confused with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Don't let them get confused with Hebrews through Revelation. Don't let them get confused with Genesis through Malachi. Being able to take that person and show them their new life, being able to show that they make sure that they get started properly, make sure that they get into the beginning Bible studies, going on with who they are in Christ, other things like that, being able to show them the dictionary of the gospel, going through that, that, that little booklet that Tom Bruchet has. Those are the issues. One of the things we want to make sure that we get with them is don't get off subject. Watch the time. You know, when you start this, when you start a little personal Bible study with this person, watch the time. Don't go more than an hour, maybe 45 minutes, you know, hour tops. And that would be including questions and answers and things like that. And it's possible if you stay on topic. Don't teach too fast or give them too much at one time. So don't do like I do and say, get this verse in one hand, this verse in another hand, another verse with your foot, and another verse with your other foot. And, you know, don't, don't go too fast or give them too much at one time. Um, above all else, do not go unprepared. If you go unprepared, you could possibly do some damage. Um, don't bring gloom into their home. Leave your burdens with the Lord and be filled with with the spirits, with the fruit of the spirit. Don't teach like you know it all. Don't argue with them. Instruct them. Don't tell them, well, you're wrong. And that's why I said, don't, do not tell a new convert, whether it's salvation or to dispensationalism. I would almost say one of the worst things you do is say, go get in this, go get in this, Facebook group because that's just going to be fussing and fighting and all that stuff instruct them don't argue with them you know I, don't, I won't even say it I know somebody personally who could have easily been turned off of right division a few years ago because of people like that fortunately they weren't But it's possible that you could turn them off from right division by putting them in a situation where they're, they're fighting and arguing. One of the crucial issues of spiritual maturity to find its base is not simply in the blood of Christ and the forgiveness of sins, but also in the cross to deal with the power of sin. The clear instructions are, are to be given over time in dealing with both what has been done and what's going to be done. Notice, noticing our co-crucifixion. Make sure that they know that our co-resurrection with Christ. Letting those things be the issue and placing our faith in that and that alone. Even after we're saved. Even if we sin, how to deal with sin in the life. Another, another one that we can deal with is our completeness in Christ is demonstrated by a list of things. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a list of things and this is how we'll end up tonight. So here's a list of all the things. You, you know, you, you, could go along, you could go along with this with the person just showing them who they are in Christ. And again, I, I do want to mention we have we have electronic versions of this whole packet. And if you've not gotten this electronic version, let me know. Email me. Greg Reeser at crossworkministries.org. That's G R E G R E S O R at crossworkministries.org. And I will send you this packet. 
I mean, you could even make this the first study. Going through who you were, you were ungodly, you were a sinner, you were God's enemy, you were condemned, you were under death's penalty, you were cursed, you're dead in sin. That's who we were. And there's verses that go along with that. Ungodly, Romans 5, 6. A sinner, Romans 5, 8. God's enemy, Romans 5, 10. Condemned, 5, 18. Romans 5, 18. Under death's penalty, Romans 6, 23. Cursed, Galatians 3, 10. Dead in sin, Ephesians 2, 1. And you can go through this. This next list is a lot quicker. And there's a whole bunch of verses, but I want to go through the list with you. And you can go through this with the person. You know, after after you've got you've you've been able to talk to them, and you've you've confirmed that they've actually made the proper decision, you can go through this. I am crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, risen with Christ, alive with Christ, ascended with Christ, seated with Christ, joint heir with Christ, and dwelt by the Father, and dwelt by the Son, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. We're beloved of God. We're a saint. We're dead to sin. We're under grace, not law. We're eternal. We're free from condemnation. We are sons of God. We are foreknown. We are predestined. We are called. We are justified. We're glorified. Now the issue when you get into that, it's not Calvinistic type stuff. And you can talk about that and, and be able to, to explain that. We're more than conquerors. We're in fellowship with God. We're the temple of God. We're washed, sanctified, a member of His body. We're victorious. We're triumphant. We're a new creature. We're reconciled. We're an ambassador. We're, right, we're the righteousness of God. We're rich. We're redeemed from the curse of the law. We're adopted. We're free, called unto liberty. We're blessed, chosen, holy, without blame, accepted in the beloved, sealed, saved by grace. We're His workmanship. We're fellow citizens. We're delivered from the power of darkness and we're translated in the kingdom of His dear Son. We're complete in Christ. We're circumcised without hands. We're forgiven all trespasses. We are the elect of God. We're delivered from the wrath to come. We're not appointed to wrath. We're saved. When you think of that list, you could spend multiple, multiple lessons with a person just showing them who they are now in Christ, being able to show who they are in the, in the completeness. We now have peace with God. We now have received the atonement. We have the mind of Christ. We have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We have obtained an inheritance. We have hope laid up in heaven. We have a holy calling. We shall be confirmed unto the end. He is our wisdom. He is our righteousness. He is our sanctification. He's our redemption. He's my victory. He's my peace. He's my hope. He's my completeness. He is my life. When you go through that list with a, with a newly saved person, Delilah just said, wow. Because, you know, really? I mean, you think about that and you're like, that's who you are in Christ. And then you can tell a newly saved person or a saved person that's been saved for 20, 30, 40, 60 years and be able to show them the verses because there's verses with every one of those. It's not just something that we think. It's something that we have a verse that shows us who we are in Christ and all we have and who He is to us now. And if that doesn't change your life, then I don't know what will. You know, you think about... You, we don't really think about all those things all the time because we get caught up in life and that's what the new convert's going to do is they're going to get caught up in life and they're going to think, man, what, was this a mistake? I probably shouldn't have done this. Things have been worse for me and I don't know how to deal with life. Just look over that list one day and be like, you know what? This is who I am in Christ. And this is all that matters. 
It's life is tough. I know that. I trust me. Right now, I'm not having to deal with it, but in about three weeks, it's going to hit me because we start back in school in about three or four weeks, and it's one of those things when I'm when I'm getting when I'm getting told by a kid or, or more specifically a parent that I've not done enough for their kid and their kid's done absolutely nothing in my class and I'm getting ridden down the rail by a parent and they're just, they, I don't feel all that stuff. But all I've got to think of is just think of that list. Just think of a few things and understand that's who I am. I'm not my job. That's not my identification. My identification isn't a teacher. My identification is a saint of the Most High God who happens to teach math in a high school. <laughs> Let that be the issue. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> That's a good way to end off. Next week, next week, like I said, if, if Wi-Fi and everything else works out for us uh, when we're in Chicago, hopefully everything will. Uh, we will go live next Wednesday night and um, we'll talk about learning how to farm and a lot of you are probably thinking oh I gotta go get my John Deere tractor no we're not talking about that Greg Greg Reeser at crosswordministries.org um, but next Wednesday night we're gonna go over that uh, one thing that I will mention is um, Sunday, we will be live again Sunday. Delilah and I, we're not leaving until Sunday evening. Um, after, after we're finished with, uh, with service on Sunday morning. Tuesday morning, they're going to be broadcasting the whole Bible conference, the summer Bible conference at uh, Shorewood Bible Church's website. Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock Central Time, so that would be 11 Eastern Time. Um, I'll be speaking on Mission Impossible, dealing with Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 10. So I'll be speaking. Um, I will also say, if you want to, I, I would, don't just tune in for me, obviously, but uh, tune in for the whole thing if you possibly can. Just make sure you're there. It starts Saturday evening and goes through Thursday evening. And so... I'm, we're looking forward to it. We've never been able to go. This is the first year that we're actually able to go to the summer conference, and we're looking forward to it. <clears throat> we're looking forward to being able to meet some some new people that I only know through email and through videos, and so I'm actually glad to be able to have time to meet with people. You know, most, most conferences, you're looking at Friday night, Saturday, and then Sunday morning, and then everybody goes away, and you never seem to have enough time to meet with people you know, with this, you go, you start on a Saturday. We're going up late, but you start on a Saturday all the way through Thursday. Um, you're going to have plenty of downtime. You're going to have opportunities to to meet and speak with new people. So, um, what I might do is I might just go ahead and type up that list and post it. So, um, I'll send I'll send you the electronic copy of the whole thing. And that'll be in there, but I'll I'm, I'll just post that list up too. It's in the ETC course, right? Yeah, it's in the ETC course, um, in 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 the in the packet that I'll send. So yeah. Well, it's eight o'clock, and we'll go. We're gonna go ahead and finish off with a word of prayer, and then we'll see you all Sunday morning. Thank you for joining us tonight, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your Word. We're just we're thankful that you would allow us to be a part of what you're doing. That you allow us to have and to be who we are just because of this of what your son did on the cross. And by us just simply placing our faith in that and that alone, we are complete in your son allow that to be the issue as we move forward and go out with this message to let other people know that they can also be all those things have that as their position and know that they are complete in christ 
and allowing that to be the motivating factor that we can glorify him because of what he's done for us on that cross. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.